Hey everybody, welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. I'm glad you've joined me. We have a really cool episode today. It's going to be part of a larger series. I just got back from Florida, where I have to say it was quite... Uh, quite a bit warmer and nicer, but we went to the Florida Aquaculture Lab in Ruskin where they start to figure out how to breed the rarest animals, how to breed common animals that are in the industry but are usually caught in the wild. And part of that right now is they're figuring out how to teach uh, aquacultural farmers or ornamental fish farmers how to breed uh, Pacific Blue Tangs, uh, races, uh, wrasses, however you want to say it, uh, eels, all sorts of different things. And today we're going to look at how they are breeding uh, little tiny baby clownfish. They are so adorable. We have some that are just a couple days old, some that are a couple weeks old, and then some that are about a month old in this video. And we're going to talk about what goes into that. So I want to give a big thanks to the aquaculture lab down there and to Casey who is a grad student who is working on her PhD uh, finishing it up this quarter and she is doing a study on how to most effectively and uh, how to with the best color and health and uh, best mortality rates to raise uh, clownfish in a lab or in a tank and so that's what we're going to look at next. So check this out. We've got a whole bunch more coming from this same facility, but I wanted to make this its own standalone uh, feature so that it wasn't super, super long. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Here it goes. Now we are in the hatchery with Casey and Brendan, and they are a husband and wife team that's working here. And what are you guys working on right now? What What is this place? Larval room, yeah, so, so tiny, the, tiny fish. The really, really tiny stuff that is really hard to see with the naked eye sometimes. So, wow, so like firefish and... So we actually, we have birdstock firefish, um, we work on blue tangs. Um, oh, cool. Right now I'm actually working with clownfish. Oh, so wow. They are much more visible because they're very big. Yeah, most, yeah. Um, other marine larvae. Sure. Um, I'm a PhD candidate right now, so I'm finishing up... Uh, research for my dissertation. Right on. Um, That's not stressful at all. No. It's like <laughs> holidays, but we're good. And um, you guys have to work in like 85 degrees hu warm, and 100% humidity. It is warm in here, so these yeah. fish are native to like Indonesia and Australia, so right. tropical climates, um, so we kind of replicate that in here. Yeah. Um, right you, now, we're working on a diet study for these guys. Okay. So clownfish are obviously a huge commodity. Yeah. Here. One of the most popular salt. Yes. Yeah. So we're trying to uh, streamline their larval production. Okay. Um, for like mass aquaculture? Yeah, so okay. for like the commercial farms that are really producing like a ton of these guys for sale. Yeah. Um, we want to kind of make it as easy as possible with maintaining really good larval quality, uh, good quality fish at the end. Yeah. Um, once they're all grown up. That makes sense. Um, and for a lot of fish that we grow here, they rely on live feeds. Yeah. Um, at first feeding, so those are a lot more expensive and labor intensive to upkeep. Yeah. So we try to transition them from a live feed to something as simple as a micro diet. Is that golden um, pearl? Oh, okay. This is Pro top dressed otohime. Okay. Um, so it's red because there's a astaxanthin. Okay. A yeah. Carotenoid added yeah. To it. Very cool. Um, to enhance. Is that how you say that word? I, I would I never went to school for it, but I always say like uh, anthocyanin and and like at the task. I'm like I can't <laughs> like it just gets stuck on my tongue. Yeah, yeah. I'm like it's, X it's is a long word, so how what's the proper acizanthin? Acizanthin. It's a okay. Carotenoid, yeah. But, okay. Um, like better in krill. Yeah, um, and that's the color enhancing in in a lot of fish. That's your reds, yellows. Yes. And, and it's a misconception that it's like a dye added to feed. Right. Um, especially in like the salmon aquaculture industry, it's a naturally occurring compound. Totally, um, okay. Which is why another, like some fish or some animals like flamingos right. are pink. Because they consume these feeds that are high in acid and it makes them. Better. Right, and, and same with, um, you know, an, like uh, if we're talking about anthocyanins, so it's like the blue and blueberries, the purple in, right. in blackberries. 
and it, the pH actually dictates if it's blue, red, or purple. Yep. Uh, and it's also in like cabbage, red onions, parrot feathers. So that's the same stuff. I mean, in yeah. theory, those same pigmentation enhancing things. And then obviously you need the omega-3s, omega-6s yes. for it to bond and metabolize and all that. Okay. Getting those essential fatty acids. Yeah. So how do you get those into the mouth of something that is like less than a millimeter? Very small. Yeah. <laughs> Um, with our smaller larvae, like Lutang, their mouth cave is so tiny that they need, they essentially need to start on a live feed. Um, so we wow. grow pelagic copepods here. Okay. Um, they're nopuli, so they're smaller baby sages. Yes. As small as 40 microns in width. Whoa. Um, which can easily fit into a small It's like thinner mouth. than a human hair, yeah. Yes, but the problem is that those copepods have very fast escape responses, so oh. sometimes the larvae have issues catching them. Can you slow um, them down? We have tried to do that this <laughs> yeah. year. Uh, one of our master's students actually finished up her master's degree on that research. Wow. She was able to physically slow down some of the, the couple pods, and we're working on incorporating that into our protocols here. Wow, that's something that, I mean, you, just, you wouldn't think of when you walk into a pet store, you look at a fish, yeah. that there is, I mean, there are, are, are researchers, scientists, doing all this work years ahead of time mm -hmm. and then breeders years a year or six months ahead of time all the people that have touched the fish that we care for yes. so I that's why I wanted to come here today and check out what you guys are doing I mean yeah. I see microscopes I see a lot of high-tech looking stuff so like is, is this a hatchery like so this like a, is a live algae okay um, live microalgae so it's phytoplankton uh, we use it in this room to actually darken the water of our experimental tanks. Oh, okay. Um, using live microalgae has been shown to increase larval survival. Um, not exactly sure why. Wow. But we think it has to do with many different factors. It can uh, create create better contrast between a live feed and a larval eye. Which oh, is very so maybe it helps um, them see their food. Helps okay. Them see their food. It also creates a very specific microenvironment and has sure. some good bacteria. So it's there. maybe a probiotic right. of some sort. Interesting. Um, and then can also decrease light intensity. Larval fish eyes are very sensitive. Right. Hatch. Right. Um, Interesting. If you want to take a look at the experimental things, you might be able to see some functions where they. Right on. Uh, but you can kind of see how the, the live microalgae is used. Um, the tanks are not super clear. It's okay. Um, yeah. But that's because the live microalgae is in there. Trying creating, to mimic a natural environment. Yes, creating a um, better contrast for them. So, are the little moving things I'm seeing the little the little dot sized things? Are those going to be so the there's fry or the, in okay? Here, so and might then be there's artemia. a little guy right there. I oh yeah. You can see him. That's a crawfish larvae. Can you point again? Actually, that yeah. actually helped my camera. Yeah. Focus. So like right here. All right. Hold on one sec. Let me get it. He's kind of zooming around. Yeah, he's zooming eat. around. So little tiny, teeny little. You can. There you go. Now we can see him. Now it's locked on. You can see the iridescent shimmer of his uh, internal organ there. Or yeah, maybe so it's that his is eyes. A, that's a swim bladder. Swim bladder, the, okay. The swim bladders of the clownfish are very um, reflective very compared cool. to some other larvae. That's kind of like, uh, you know, the stomach lining the outside of it on all the mammals mm -hmm. is like that silver, yeah, shiny like stuff. Sheet. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. So these guys are seven days old. Seven um, days and old. they're still that small, but wow. believe it or not, these are massive. <laughs> yeah. For what we usually work with in here. So. Wow, so there's not really a way to know when something is hatched without looking at a sample? Or, I mean, how do you guys... So it depends on the species. Okay. Um, clownfish, they lay their eggs demersally, so they'll attach it to a substrate, kind of like you see in Finding Nemo. Sure. It's attached yeah. to an underneath of a rock or something. Right. Um, and that's partially why these fish are larger and easier to grow. Okay. To some of the other fish. Blue tame. By, or blue tang and um, we're working on flame hawkfish. Wow. They're pelagic spawners, which is right. the majority of marine um, fish. So would you consider these like benthic, or what do you call that when um, they're like on a substrate? Demersal. Demersal. So benthic is more just like the bottom. bottom. Or okay. Demersal is substrate. It can be like you know reef rock, coral um, stuff like yeah, that. Exactly. Okay. So very cool. And yeah. so. What were you, I mean, like, what were you literally doing? Are these all the same age and you're doing different diets to try, like, yeah, to so test this, something out? These three tanks is, uh, comprises of one replicate of 
the experiment, so each one has a different weaning regime. Um, oh. I'm trying to get them off of a live feed and onto that micro diet I showed you. Right. As early as possible. So that's much easier for the farmers in the yeah, long run. Yeah, it should run. be, and it should be more cost effective too. Okay, very cool. So, I mean, are you looking at things like like golden pearls or like what would you be? I mean, that's so that's the next step I take. Okay. Um, I find out like when physiologically they can be put onto a micro diet. Okay. And benefit from it. Yeah. Um, and then I try different brands. Interesting. So. Uh, the top dress Odafine I showed you is kind of the industry standard. Yeah. Uh, so I do plan on using that as one of my treatments for the next experiment, but also trying a variety of other commercially available Very cool. diet to see if, if that's something else can compete. But and so then when you finish your PhD, you'll publish probably. Yes. And I mean, I, that's a whole other, I can make a whole video on the crazy, <laughs> annoying publishing world, but... Yes. Uh, that would, in theory, then be public information, yeah? Right, so I actually already have a paper out on clownfish that came out in uh, October. Okay, um, cool. And that was just on Congrats. the digestive physiology things. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the next paper will be all on the weaning and diet stuff, so... Very um, cool. And what's... Can people look it up? Does it, like, the name of the paper? I've just... Someone um, might's gonna, is going to um, ask, I know. It's, Characterizing the digestive ontogeny of the clownfish Amphiprion oscillaris. Oh, okay, yeah. So Easy to remember. Yeah. <laughs> in aquaculture, Journal of Aquaculture? Yes, Journal of Aquaculture. Hey, congrats. Thank That's you. awesome. Yeah. yeah. We're walking down the next aisle, and she's taking me to the next stage in the life cycle of these fish. Oh, wow. Those are stinking cute. I mean, I see why Finding Nemo was a hit. These, these <laughs> are really, really cute. So, how old are these ones? Uh, these are about a month and a half old. Wow, you're growing them pretty quick then. Yeah, they grow fairly quickly once they... And they don't need sea anemones or any of that, like, nope. that doesn't play a role it's in there. It's not an obligate relationship, uh, okay. fortunately. For yeah, us, that's great. For us. Um, yeah, it, they do just fine. And is this their food that's this being... This is the Artemia that we're okay. trying to wean them off of. Oh, okay. Um, and then here's the... This is a, yeah, yeah. This is a type of micro diet that we've put them on once they're right on weaned, so. cool yeah. so wasn't that awesome you guys i think it is absolutely so cool to see that they're doing this that we won't need to get wild caught uh fish quite as much and granted clownfish have been bred in captivity for some time but uh figuring out how to do it in mass rather than in a niche uh hobby or overseas uh in in farms where they have it set up for that america really hasn't had it set up rather than for the hobby breeders that are doing kind of specialized colors and things so bringing that price down and not having to harvest them from the wild is going to be a big game changer plus it, it's really interesting in that it allows us to figure that out for these fish and it will help in figuring out nutritional profiles and things for a whole bunch of other saltwater fish that right now we can't breed in captivity and this facility is the same one i brought you guys the video from four years ago that did the pacific blue tang they did the firefish um, they've done all sorts of cool stuff and they do all sorts of firsts there so i have to give them a big thank you and i have to give you guys a huge thank you if you stayed around to the end uh you can say something about dory not Nemo in the comments if you want to leave a comment and just let me know you watched it. I always love it when people see things all the way through on these nerdier deep dive episodes. But uh, it's not possible without you guys watching, sharing, liking, subscribing, and the members. You guys, I can't thank you enough. It allowed me to pay for this trip and go and see cool things and bring them to you. Now, I know the audio was a little off on this one. We had mics and everything, but it was just too loud in there. So uh, we we used uh, the, an oriented mic on me and that was the best audio we could get. So I apologize. Not all the videos from this will be like that, but I will see you guys next time. And thank you so much for watching.